The Fantasy Six Pack Hour. With your hosts, Joe Bond. Ah, you're awful. And AJ Applegar. It's Sin Shu Sin Shu Chu. It's a mouthful. All right, all right. Welcome to the Fantasy Six Pack Hour. My name is Joe Bond, founder of FantasySixPack.net. With me, as always, AJ Eppergarth. How's it going, man? What's up? <laughs> so excited to be here. Um, <laughs> how's, uh, it's been how's a cor- week. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were kind of here last week for, you know, a good... Well, I guess when you really yeah. think about it, you were here for about an hour last week. <laughs> you st- came out on, what, the yeah. Vikings pick and then stayed on the whole time. Yeah, I guess... Uh, but yeah, I mean, we didn't do the, the actual fancy six pack show last week. We did the, uh, live NFL draft day one show. So if you haven't seen it, it's four hours of goodness, uh, time stamped all the players. So I get it. If you don't want to listen to a four and a half hour show, uh, so go, go find your guys, go listen to them. It's, it's good stuff. Uh, live reaction with me and Cillian, uh, look who are our, our primary NFL draft guru here at over fancy six pack, uh, tons of guests on. It's a good time, man. I, I, I have a blast on it. Second year in a row we've done it, so I have a blast. Um, we got a good show tonight, though. You know, we, we took about a week to kind of digest everything. Uh, we wanted to come back and, and review the landing spots of these rookies. Uh, we got a good sh- good guest to come on and help us do that. Um, but first, I want to remind everybody, you know, check us out on YouTube. If you're not, if you're not doing that, uh, like and subscribe us. Subscribe to us there. Go to Anchor or any of your um, favorite you know, places to find, listen to podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, you name it. We're there. Um, go and like us, subscribe to us there. It always helps. So, uh, we, we appreciate you guys out there listening to us, but, uh, yeah, bringing on, coming on the show to help us today though, cover these rookies is, uh, Jeff Lambert founder of going for com and host of the armchair fantasy show. Uh, <clears throat> Jeff, you there? Yeah. What's up guys. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, man. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm looking forward to you know, dropping some knowledge on people with these rookies, man, it'd be a good time. So definitely, definitely. It's a little bit different being on this side of the mic, you know, not being the host. So yeah, uh, nah. it would be a uh, be, be unique experience for me. I, hey, I have fun sometimes just coming on and shooting the shit with people, man. It's, uh, it's, it's different, you know, definitely I, I is. It, though. So I know, well, <coughs> sorry about that. So went down my throat, <coughs> damn. Um, so something we'd like to do on the show that you said you wanted to, uh, join in with us is, is our beer of the week. So let's do that first. Mm, All right. So- beer. Sorry for that. <laughs> you didn't know that was coming. Uh, but yeah, Sorry. go ahead and, and jump in and let us know what you're drinking tonight, man. <clears throat> All right. So usually on my on my show, I have at least uh, two beers during my show. And I always have unique beers. Uh, I go to usually Trader Joe's or whatever, and I get like those uh, blind bags with like, just like six beers they pick randomly. Tonight, unfortunately, I didn't have time to go to Trader Joe's, so I just went to the, the local uh, food line up here and uh, but my, my wife bought me a, a Blue Moon uh, a variety pack, and in that variety pack is an iced coffee Blue Moon, uh, mm-hmm. which is what I'm drinking right now. And actually, uh, kind of surprised. It, it actually is, is very, very good. If you like coffee, if you like beer, it's like the perfect blend. Uh, it even has caffeine in it, so if you need that kick to get up in the morning, <laughs> if you want a beer, you can have, have a beer. But uh, actually, it's, it's really good. I was surprised. I was kind of nervous, like, oh, I'm going to bring this on the show, my first time having it. I'm not sure how it's going to go, but uh, actually, it's really good. I, I really enjoy it. I'm not the biggest coffee drinker, but uh, I might get into that. <laughs> Wife can go to Dunkin'. I'll just crack her up in a Blue Moon coffee stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got my coffee. AJ, what you got, man? All right. So I am drinking, I believe, finally, my last uh, Manor Hill Brewing Comet Tastrophe. I don't remember if I've had this on the show yet or not. We're Pretty track. cool artwork. It's a big... <laughs> hop thing comet whatever uh manor hill brewing uh local brew out of uh elegant city maryland and uh it's pretty good i give it a 375 on uh on untapped it's it's definitely like earthy grassy um you know it's got some bite to it in the aftertaste uh but it, it is fairly hoppy for sure obviously a ton of comet hops go figure um but um yeah it's pretty good it's a pounder, so it'll it'll go down pretty easily after this week, and <laughs> you know, then my next one will come up as well. 
Good stuff. All right. I'm drinking a uh, <clears throat> one of the places by me finally is carrying these in stock. It's from Alexandria, Virginia. Our good friend Jason loves this brewery. You probably see him check them in all the time on Untapped. Aslan Brewing oh, yeah. Company. Yep. Uh, this is their beer drinking is not a crime. Uh, but these guys make fantastic beer. I've had like two or three of them, so I'm happy to be able to find them up here. I guess during the uh, the quarantine, they're they're expanding their delivery <laughs> so that they can get more business, and it's working. Uh, so this is a, a double dry hop, double IPA, eight and a half percent. It's uh, you know it's it's definitely hazy. It's it's got some you know juiciness to it too. Um, it's made with Nelson and Citra hops. I'll be honest, I've never heard of Nelson hops, but obviously I'm familiar with Citra. Um, it's it's just a solid IPA. I mean, like I have not been disappointed with a single one of the ones I've had of theirs. Um, so I gave it I gave it a solid four and a quarter on Untapped. Nice. So nice. All right, man. Hey, Joe, real, yeah. real quick, Joe, I want to ask you a question. So I see you wearing your Redskins shirt, and you just mentioned Alexandria. Uh, I'm actually probably, if you're in Alexandria, I'm about a half an hour south of you. I'm in Woodbridge, Virginia. Yes, that's right. I noticed that on um, on on Twitter, and I forgot to mention that. Uh, yeah, I grew up in Northern Virginia. Uh, I grew up nice. in Fairfax, Burke, Virginia area. Uh, went to Virginia Tech, came back to the area. Now I live just in j- just north of D.C. in Maryland. Um, you're in, like, only ish area type of thing um like gotcha. just north of silver spring um but yeah i actually lived in the woodbridge for like two years right after college i got a job there uh nice, actually nice. in dumfries but yeah that's pretty cool you from the area or where are you uh i actually grew up in uh, newport news okay uh, obviously three hours south from where yep. i'm at now i'm military my dad moved up here when i was in the 11th grade and i've been here ever since cool cool nice <clears throat> All right, man. Well, let's jump into this. Like I said, we got a lot to talk about. There's there's a ton of rookies, and you know, unfortunately, sorry about that. Um, we we can't cover them all. We'd be here for four hours, and I don't not trying to do that again to anybody. Um, but let's let's jump off here with with the rookie quarterbacks. Obviously, starting off one dot one. Um, <clears throat> we're going Joe Burrow, Bengals quarterback. Uh, you know, they <laughs> just announced today they they cut. Um, <clears throat> yeah, like I was saying, Andy Dalton. Andy Dalton. Dalton, thank you. Yeah, they just cut Andy Dalton, so uh, he's on the depth chart on this on this uh this slide we made, but that's that's no longer true. We made it earlier in the day and didn't go back and fix it. Forgot. Um, but yeah, break down Joe Burrow quickly and and kind of let us know what you expect fantasy wise. Uh, well, Joe Burrow, obviously, we knew all along he was going to go one hundred and one to the Bengals, so we've kind of been able to sort of uh, critique him uh, pre-draft, but uh, now post-draft, I like him even better. They went and they drafted T. Higgins as well. Mm -hmm. Um, So now you got A.J. Green, you got Boyd, you got T. Higgins there, you got Joe Mixon out of the backfield. Uh, They, you know, they look really good on paper. Obviously, very young team. So if you're drafting Joe Burrow in your dynasty league, you're going to have Joe Burrow hopefully for 10, 15 years uh, with a very good offense. Uh, I think if you're talking super flex leagues, he's probably the 101. Um, if you're talking uh, one quarterback league, you're probably looking at the end of the first, top of the second round to get Joe Burrow. But uh, if you somehow pair him with T. Higgins, I think you got a great deal for, for quite a while there. I think that's going to be a great uh, combination. And, yeah, I think the Bengals offense is definitely looking up. Yeah, that's a, that's a good call for, for Dynasty Leagues, like Superflex. Um, I, I have like. I'm I'm sort of a quarterback needy team in, in one in one league, but uh, not so much in the other. And I've got like the fifth or seventh pick. I forget which one it is. I haven't looked too closely at it. I'm half tempted to grab him early, even though it's a one quarterback league, just because I'm a quarterback needy team and I'm like, there's nobody else to go get. So, yep. um, but yeah, so team need kind of plays a, a role there for that. But um, AJ, you got anything else to add to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I think he's he's definitely who we knew was going to get drafted here. So I think he's the obvious starter and uh, he should, he should pan out. I mean, worst case, the Bengals are going to suck again and he's going to have to throw the ball a lot. So he could get you some, some solid fantasy production. Agreed. So moving on to the next man off the board here is Mr. Tua Tagoviola. And that was with the Dolphins at the fifth pick overall. Uh, This was a popular landing spot for Tua all along. Uh, A lot of the experts that we saw um, 
basically pinned him here as well. So what are your what are your thoughts on on Tua, Jeff? Uh, well, first and foremost, I love what the Dolphins did in the draft. You know, getting Tua. You know, they got a, t- a tackle there in the first round as well, uh, and they kind of passed on running back, which you know seems to be something that a lot of teams will will do these days. I think because of that, they actually uh, helped themselves quite a bit. They're you know able to fill a lot of holes. Uh, they Frida um, from the 49ers. So they got a run back to last them with uh, Jordan Howard as well. They got two running backs there to kind of get them through this year. They won't be very good. Two will probably sit behind Fitzgerald for or Fitzpatrick for a uh, for a little while, and then uh, once he gets in there, you know he'll have protection, the offensive line. They might get good draft picks again next year. Uh, they'll probably get their running back next year, which is another good class of running backs. You got Travis Etienne coming out, so they could possibly get them. And I think again, just like Burrow, I think it's I think it's a great situation for him. He's going to be the starter there eventually. We know that. Um, I think Miami, you know, all last year was tank for Tua, tank for Tua. They didn't tank. You know, they kind of got some wins they weren't supposed to get, and they still got Tua. So I think it all worked out for them. They didn't get the 101. They got the you know the 105 and still got Tua. They got some great pieces in the draft this this past draft, and uh, you know he's got some good receivers there. Devontae Parker finally showed up. Uh, he's got Preston Williams coming back from a, a, a season injury from last year. You know, so I think you know you got Mike Isecki who finally started to show up a little bit uh, at the tight end position. He's a great athlete, so I think Tua in this offense is going to be a be a great, great, uh, great pick for Dynasty. I, I only laugh a little bit at Mike Isecki because uh, AJ I and I face off in our in our redraft face six pack league, and uh, I snag Isecki right at the end of the year as my tight end, and he had Fitzpatrick as his quarterback. So of course Fitzpatrick goes off that last game, but he went off throwing everything to Mike Gusecki so it didn't matter <laughs> and I ended up snake, uh, sneaking out a win by what like six points it was so close it, yeah, <laughs> it, it came down to, to being real close and I still am more pissed off at Mike Boone well or myself for getting him and thinking he was going to actually be worth <laughs> the shit but yeah. yeah and I, I like this spot for Tua um, I mean I love Fitzpatrick the guy is just a baller he goes out every week you know somehow finds a way to grow six more inches of beard hair before each game and just <laughs> dominates you know with both touchdowns and interceptions so it's uh, you know it's definitely the uh, the good and the bad but I think it's a good Good quarterback situation for for Tua as far as who to learn from, to learn what to do and what not to do. Um, so I, I like this spot a lot. Yeah, not not a whole lot to add there. So I'll just move on here. Uh, the next quarterback in the draft taken with the next pick was from the Chargers. They took Justin Herbert. I'm gonna be honest. I I didn't think that this was a great pick by the Chargers. I I know their quarterback needy, but I feel like this might have been a bit of a reach. I'm not sure Herbert's up there, but that's what teams do. You know, they they go reach for those quarterbacks, and we saw it a couple times in this draft. So, um, Jeff, what do you what do you got with this one? Well, I kind of disagree with you. I think Herbert is kind of the real deal. I think if Tua and Burrow weren't in this draft, I think he might be the 101. Um, I do think that he's got all the tools to be a quarterback. Then you hear that all the time. You know, he has all the tools to be a quarterback, and a lot of times those guys don't pan out. But I think Herbert is in the best situation where he can sit behind Tyrod Taylor, um, who's kind of become that bridge quarterback, a career bridge quarterback, so to speak. <laughs> Aww, and I go, think you know you get him at you know in put in week six, week seven. You know, they probably won't be very, very good. So I think he'll be able to come in and and just kind of do his thing um, and learn as the game goes on. They got some good pieces there. Usually, you get a guy at the the sixth pick, you're looking at their offense, and it's not very good. But you've got Keenan Allen there. You know, you got Eckler, who had an amazing season last year. You've got Mike Williams still there. You got Hunter Henry. Um, so this is a really good offense and, and a team really that should be, uh, you know, up there in, as far as record goes. But just had some really bad luck with injuries and such. And Rivers last year just wasn't protected and kept throwing interceptions all the every game. So, but I think Herbert's in the best situation here where he's not going to come out to start right away. And I think in the long run, it'll help them out. And Chargers will just kind of keep right on rolling there. Yeah, I don't know, man. There's just something about it. Like, I get, you know, he's got the arm strength. You know, he's got talent, right? You you get that. But it's just when you watch him, it's like accuracy was missing at times more often than he wanted it to. He fumbled a lot. Um, he just, in, in the big games, in the big moments, he wasn't able to come through more often than not, it felt like. And that's what worries me about him coming into the NFL. Like, I get the tools, but he's just not it like it's not a complete quarterback package and maybe it's teachable but i it, that's what worries me going that early 
Yeah, that's a fair point, and that, that is something that you, you've heard kind of knocked on him a little bit. And um, you know, in the past, you know, when you had those huge quarterback contracts as rookies, you know, it kind of sets you back a little bit. Now they're right. not as as you know, they can trap the quarterback in the early rounds, not to pay him as much, and if it ends up not working out, you know, you just move on. But I think it was definitely worth the risk with this kid. Fair enough. AJ, you got anything? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I I don't hate the pick. I I think that that they were in need of the quarterback, so I wasn't surprised to see this pick made. And, and I like Her, Herbert Tangibles. I, I think he can grow into being a serviceable quarterback. Um, and, and like like you said, Jeff, there there's already a, a ton of offensive talent on this team, so I think they'll be okay. I, I don't think they're going to be great by any means, but you know, hopefully Tyrod gets a little bit of a longer leash, you know, being a, being a hokey alum, Joe and I like to see him succeed, but we'll see what happens. So the next guy we got here is a little bit of irony with his name because he was not getting much love at all. And that's Jordan love getting picked by the Packers at the 26th overall pick. Uh, I mean, obviously, I guess this is the the heir apparent to Aaron Rodgers, kind of the Aaron Rodgers to Brett Favre, maybe not quite on the same level. But what do you think of the love pick? Are you are you loving it or are you hating it? I I don't like it. Uh, I don't necessarily hate or dislike Jordan Love. I just don't like the situation here where he's going to sit behind Rodgers for at least two years, if not three. I think Rodgers' contract actually might take him to to twenty twenty three, so even closer to four years. Uh, I think that last year, though, he probably wouldn't be there anymore. But, yeah, I think if you're drafting him in Dynasty, you're going to have to play the super long game because he's just not going to get in unless there's an injury to Aaron Rodgers. He's not going to play. He's just going to sit behind Rodgers. And now, you know, four years from now, if if Love comes in and he's the next Hall of Fame quarterback for the Packers, like we had, you know, Favre to Rodgers and now Rodgers doing his thing, you know, we'll all look kind of stupid thinking that, oh, it was a dumb pick because, you know, they'll have 15 years now of Jordan Love and they'll have another Hall of Fame quarterback. So, who knows what it'll be in four years for Dynasty right now? His value definitely took a hit. I think you, if you're drafting him, you, you're thinking super long term, and that's kind of hard to do in Dynasty because who knows where your team will be in three or four years from now. So taking love at any point in the draft is going to be tough because you get to put him on your taxi squad or keep him on your bench for the longest time before you can actually use him. Yeah, I I agree. Like I don't hate him. I thought he'd be like a second round quarterback um, at at best, like a late first round, but. Not the Packers. It was just a weird pick. Everybody was just dumbfounded when they got when it happened, and I get it. Like, and we said it during the live draft show. It's like, oh well, you know, this is what they did with Aaron Rodgers and Brett Favre. But then I started thinking more. It's Brett Favre was retiring like every other day. They didn't know if he was going to be there tomorrow, so they had to take somebody. This <laughs> Rodgers is going to be there, or at least he's supposed to be, right? Like, um, unless they know something we don't. But I'm guaranteeing Rodgers is pissed off with this pick and uh it's not going to make the situation any better there like he already you know we saw what happens to Aaron Rodgers when he gets and he's not getting along with the coaching staff in the front office he's not playing well I wouldn't have done this to him at all I just feel like they needed to draft other people around him to try to win a Super Bowl in this last little window with Aaron Rodgers but what do I know <laughs> yeah I, I I'm I, I agree with Jeff's stance. I don't like hate the pick. I, I understand it, but I don't necessarily agree with it. You know, they should have gone after a receiver. They need somebody else on the outside to help Devonte Adams and and Aaron Rodgers. Really, I mean, the only reason that team was thirteen and three last year was because I felt like their schedule was kind of weak, and their defense really stepped up and and played really well. Um, but they also played a lot of cupcake teams. So I, I think that if they're going to make this, you know, run towards another Super Bowl in this last few years of Rodgers' contract uh, and possibly, you know, uh, career as a Packer, they should have gone out and gotten him some something better than this. Um, you know, they could have sat and, and got a quarterback – a round or two later if they were really that you know adamant on getting their next uh their next big thing there but my my quick follow-up question for you jeff is as far as a super flex dynasty 
how does that change your draft view of Jordan Love? If you did have a taxi for, you know. Yeah, if you've got taxi and you, you're in a super flex league and you probably already have, you know, three quarterbacks at minimum, maybe even four quarterbacks, uh, I can see, I can justify it more stashing him, you know, on a taxi squad or even on a deep bench if you don't have taxi. Because uh, then, you know, eventually he will be that quarterback there. He, you know, if they put the draft capital in him, they'll give him the shot to be the starter. So in the long term, he would definitely be someone you'd want. And just to go to that comp with uh, with 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 Favre real quick, when they drafted Rodgers, the Packers weren't very good. I mean, they went four and twelve the year they got Rodgers, eight and eight the following year. Uh, his last year there, they were thirteen and three. But you look at the Packers from last year. I mean, they were one game from the right. Super Bowl. You think they'd be trying to go all in to win that? You know, win the Super Bowl. And they I, yeah, no, draft a quarterback of all, of all things. It doesn't really help them at all. It's kind of a weird yeah, take. It, I don't. I don't. So understand. weird. They didn't draft a single receiver. They drafted just about nothing to help Rodgers on mm-hmm. that offense. I mean, even the running back they pick, like uh, I like AJ Dillon as much as anybody, but it's not doing anything for you. You got two very capable right. running backs in front of him. <laughs> it's just a weird. Weird draft. Um, Did y'all see that graphic going around on Rodgers about his touchdowns to first round picks in his career? <laughs> yeah, he's one. Yeah. <laughs> Throwing one touch. It was uh, last year to Mercedes Lewis. Oh, that's, people. Oh, that's, that's awful. I, I mean, it's kind of dumbfounding, but really not when you look at. I mean, you look at the other guys on that list too. It's like, all right, well, yeah, this I get, this I get, but only one. I mean, that's that's. Very hey, surprising. To hey, me. they got Devin Funches, so maybe they thought they were good. <laughs> no, 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 not with the Funches. No, obvious joke. All right, moving on. Last quarterback we're going to talk about here, Jalen Hurts. Um, I don't know. I don't know what to think about this one. You know, I, I like Jalen Hurts as a as like an athletic type backup quarterback in my opinion but maybe i'm wrong maybe the eagles see something but at the same time the eagles have went so like i don't think hair hurts is gonna play a whole lot i i just don't know what to really think about this one at all like this one's even more confusing than love in my opinion what do you think jeff yeah this one's definitely even though he was in the second round not the first round i think this one is a little bit more confusing because wentz is a young quarterback at least with rogers and just saying okay him. to the end <laughs> potentially could get replaced but I mean you got Wentz there I know you talk about the injuries to Wentz and will you know Hurts kind of filling for the injuries but you can't really draft saying okay my quarterback's going to get hurt so let me get a quarterback to take over for him it just doesn't you don't do things that way I don't believe in the NFL um you know you heard the Taysom Hill com- comparisons I'm sure that they might use him as a, in two quarterback mm-hmm. but I'm like okay fine you want to do that don't take him in the second round there's so much more value there that you can get to help your team you know, get another receiver, get, you know, whatever they need, defensive players, they, they need a cornerback. So they get a quarterback in the second round to be a gadget player at best or a backup quarterback at worst. It, it just makes zero sense to me whatsoever. Yeah. AJ, you're the, uh, you're the Philly boy. What, uh, what do you think about this I, one? I, I could probably have four hours of conversation on this alone. <laughs> um, you got 40 I, seconds. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. <laughs> I didn't love the pick. Obviously, um, I was, uh, you know, as stated on the show, I was kind of surprised with their first round pick, um, who we'll talk about a little later. But um, I, I just don't. I don't get it. I mean, I get the side of well, Wentz played great in his you know near MVP season until he got injured, and then Nick Foles came in, ran the offense you know, seamlessly and won us a Super Bowl. You know, it, it's it's hard to say that Foles is the reason we won the Super Bowl. He's a huge part of it. Um, and I love me some Nick Foles. Uh, but I, I still like Wentz. I mean, I think Wentz has to be the guy. You just paid him a dump truck sum of money and it just kicked in. Why are you burning a second round pick on a quarterback who I I think has great ability and is very athletic. But again, they, they could have sat filled a much bigger need and, you know, help their secondary or gone receiver receiver, like a fantasy draft. you know, if you're doing zero running back, I don't know. It's just definitely a head scratcher. 
it, to me, it's typical Eagles. They're they're trying to outsmart everybody that's out there and go after these weird picks. And I mean, hopefully it pans out. I don't really agree with the Taysom Hill comparison. I just don't think Hertz is the same, you know, type of player. Agreed. He he could fill in that role somewhat, but it's not going to be like Taysom Hill. They're not going to put him out there on special team punt coverage. They're not going to have him, you know, in a maybe they'll put him in as a two quarterback set here and there, but you know, every time they do that in, in New Orleans, it seems like Taysom just gets the direct snap and runs the ball. So I just don't know if if, if that's the way he's built and if that's going to be a good idea too. Because yeah, no, if he it, is your quote unquote insurance policy for he's also when gonna get hurt, <laughs> not if, but when Wentz gets hurt again, then why are you going to risk throwing him out there and let him potentially get hurt? Then you're back to looking at potentially Nate Sudfeld if if they're even going to keep him on the roster or uh, or McCown again if they yeah, decide. It's to a weird one, back. man. And like I, I, a lot of people want to say like, oh, you know, Wentz wasn't very good last year. Like the dude threw for four thousand yards. Like I've heard that said a lot. Like Wentz he wasn't was very good last year, like, last year for what he like, had. I know, and he was playing with absolute junk i mean every receiver was hurt for that team it's just it's such a strange pick to me like more so than love i think the stat and i'm not i'm not 100 on this but i think the stat was he's the first quarterback to throw for over four thousand yards and none of his receivers had over 500 yards yep i did see that stat it's that's absolutely nuts that's i mean that's absurd to me running backs and of course Ertz and goddard well yeah i mean they've got they got so much I'm, no, I'm not in, trying to. I'm not trying to discredit what you said. I'm just saying, like, the fact that that's still, true is crazy. Like, okay, that's a that's a really abnormal stat that you're going to have, and not something that you would try to seek every year. Um, you have the opportunity to build your receiver core and not have to do that. So, I don't know. I just, I didn't love the pick. I, I thought it was a definite head scratcher. Yep. So, but let's move on to uh, more Eagles talk with Andy Reid. This is quite possibly the most satisfying pick of the Uh, first round for me. Um, Clyde Mm. Edwards Elair, the last pick of the first to the Chiefs. I won a bet on this pick. uh, basically, I don't know if it's twofold, but at least onefold by saying to Joe on on live air, the Chiefs are going after a running back. Watch and see it happen. And I, I can't remember what pick we were at. It was maybe twenty eight like, or twenty seven. While they were on the clock. <laughs> What's that? It was like while they were on the clock. <laughs> no, it wasn't. I told. I said that they were going to draft the running back well before they were on no. the clock. But then right anyway. when they were on the clock, I said, watch, they're going to take Clyde Edwards, L.A., who wasn't really, in my mind, the the top running back of the nope. draft. But we'll, we'll, we'll dig into that later. So, Jeff, what do you think about uh, CEH here going to the Chiefs? It was definitely surprising, and it goes to show you just how much us fantasy guys know about what the NFL is going to do because we all had you know, Jonathan Taylor – DeAndre Swift or Dobbins going in that first round. And, and here comes this guy, Clyde Edwards-Hilaire, that comes in the first round. And no one had him going in the first round. So kind of surprising that it was him. I think it's a great pickup for both fantasy and for football. For the Chiefs, he does everything that they need him to do. He's a great uh, receiver out of the backfield. Uh, he can run the ball. He's shifty. He isn't the fastest guy out there. Uh, but he doesn't need to be on this team because they're going to be so, you know, in the red, red zone so often that it's going to be, you know, scoring touchdowns left and right. Uh, like I said, he can catch the ball out of the backfield. He made the biggest jump in my rankings. He went from about seven or eight uh, pre-draft up to probably the 101 right now uh, in, in Dynasty. I think he's the, in, in one quarterback leagues. I think he's going to be awesome in that offense. Uh, I think Damian Williams is just a jag. I think he's just another guy. He's just going to be backing him up. Uh, it's going to be the Edwards Hilaire show. And I think, you know, you being an Eagles fan, you know that Andy Reid likes to have one running back. He doesn't like the RBBC. He's always had one guy that he leans on. And 
I think it's going to be uh, it's going to be Hilaire. Yeah, I'm not really sure, honestly. Uh, I mean, I think the fit, the marriage is good. Um, I just also think there's a lot of bodies there, and, and and I'm not totally sold on the fact that like he's just going to take over. I think Williams is still going to get plenty. Um, but I mean, I, I get it. I mean. It, it, it fits their offense, right? Better than probably anybody else except for maybe Swift. But um, that's that's what the Chiefs do. They go get what they want, and it works out. Uh, so the running back in the Chiefs is a good is a good play. I had to ask you, though, like, do you think – you said he's your one-on-one in Dynasty. You think he's a better long-term play than, say, like a Jonathan Taylor, who we're about to talk about in a few minutes? Uh, as long as you're talking PPR, then yeah, I think I think okay. he is because he will be catching a ton of passes out of the backfield to give you that floor that uh, that JT probably won't get you in, in Indy. I think uh, they still have Hines there. He'll fill that role as third down sort of receiver out of the backfield. I think JT would be a, an amazing running back, but I don't think he'll catch a ton of passes. Okay. Uh, and just one more thing on Hilaire, too. I think it, it was a, a very smart thing to do for the Chiefs to get him in that first round. Because now they have that extra, you know, that fifth-year option for a first-round player, and I think we've seen in, with the running backs, you, you keep them for five years and then you let them walk. You know, you yeah. don't pay them big money, so he's going to be be there for five years, and then I think you know he'll be able to walk away and move on. But I think it's gonna it's an awesome pick for them. Yeah, I I love the pick. Uh, well, not only because I want to bet on so. it, but um, yeah, I, just for Andy Reid, I, I thought it was. Uh, I mean, it, it it had him written all over it. This is what they were doing. And they had plenty of other needs. Obviously, we've talked about their crowded backfield. So running back wasn't necessarily a need for them. But why not get a guy that really reminds you of Brian Westbrook? Yep. And that, that was the best comparison I saw. I didn't even think about it. I'm like, oh, okay, you know, he loved Shady. And then he brought him back. And I'm like, oh, shit. Yeah, well, Westbrook was phenomenal for them for you know a decade and in fantasy too so yep. I, I love the pick for them if i'm not mistaken i think andy reed made that comp right he's the one that said it, it reminded him of westbrook yeah. so that's always good when your coach is calling you with a, a, a good player like that yeah all right so let's move on here uh the next running back that was taken in the draft by the lions was uh deandre swift um who was personally my favorite running back coming out of the draft um, him and Taylor to me were like one A one B, but Swift was just slightly ahead because I thought, you know, he can catch passes a little more, kind of like what you were saying with Taylor. Um, but what um, what are you thinking here with his his landing spot with the Lions? Of course, they got Carry on Johnson there, who's eh, we don't quite know yet. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little a little worried about the landing spot. I did slip. He was my number one going into the draft. I think I've got him at three or four now um and and not because of carrying on johnson per se but more about matt patricia and how he runs his running backs he likes the rbbc he likes the you know the the quicker guy in the between the 20s and then bringing the big guy to get the the the, the end zone the you know the rushing touchdown which kind of kills all your value he got got that from bill belichick and it, it makes me nervous a little bit i do think swift is the most talented running back in that backfield i do think he would be the number one overall uh, in that backfield, I think he takes over for Carry on Johnson pretty quickly. Uh, he will catch pl- passes out of the backfield as long as Stafford remains healthy. We saw that with Theo Riddick being that back for a while, that he was a, a good back out of the backfield. Swift can kind of do both. Uh, so I think the upside is still there. Uh, I just a little nervous there with Matt Patricia being the coach. Now, if he has another bad year and they get rid of him, that can change things quite drastically. But with him being there in the RBBC tendency, it's kind of makes me nervous a little bit. Yeah, I mean, carry on being there worries me. I, I've owned him a couple years now, and both years clearly didn't really get much out of him. Um, I think he's a talented black back, but just just having him come in and and seeing that, I mean, he's what in his third year now. Yeah, yeah. and he's they're already young, it's like drafting his heir apparent. I, yeah, I, th- I think he. I think this is his third year. Yeah, but so, he's still he's still super young though. He's twenty three or something like that. Is that? Oh know. yeah, yeah. He's Which he's crazy. He's I was shocked young, at that. But I, I don't know. Either that, or they're just gonna try to have a nice one two punch. But I, I think Swift takes over eventually too. Yeah, I kind of wonder. Like you know, maybe they they've always wanted to try to run the ball there. So maybe now they think, okay, keep carrying on a little fresh. Um, 
you know, Swift is there to help out with that. So now we can definitely have a running game all year long. Hopefully both guys don't get hurt at the same time, right? So they never – they always said, like, for year one, they didn't want Stafford to throw the ball, you know, 600 times again. Um, and last year they had to because Carrion got hurt right away and they had no running game. And then Stafford got hurt. So <laughs> I just wonder, like, yeah. if kind of the backside of this, like, how much does this hurt Stafford's value, which – his value going into this year for just redraft leagues was like what, top 12, 13, 14 quarterback in most dra- most rankings I saw. I don't think I'm keeping him that high anymore. I don't know. Jeff, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think he definitely drops a little bit. Um, but like you said, that Swift catches passes too. So I, I do still think that he will pass the ball quite a bit, maybe mm-hmm. not 600 times, but I think he'll be in that 500 range still. I think. You know, last year before he got hurt, you know, Stafford was, I think, was like QB2 or QB3. Yeah, I was uh, like QB3. He was like, he was having an awesome season until <clears throat> he got hurt. So, you know, if he comes out like that again this year, I think that Swift will have a big season. I think Stafford will still be a, you know, that maybe not top 12, maybe top 15 QB and still be good for fantasy. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it, it all comes down to Stafford being healthy because if he gets hurt again, then that offense will not be good. No, <laughs> definitely not. All right, so the guy that we got here next is uh, Jonathan Taylor. Touched on him briefly. Um, Colts took Taylor uh, with the ninth pick in the second round, 41st overall. I mean, they still have Marlon Mack there, but for how long? Uh, What are your thoughts on on Taylor, Jeff? I think uh, Mack is pretty much dead. I think Jonathan Taylor is a much better running back. Uh, Mack doesn't catch passes, so he won't get that uh, ability there either. Like I said, they do have uh, Naeem Hines there who will be catching the passes. Jonathan Taylor, like I said, is a better running back than Mack. Uh, he stays healthier. You know, Mack, I don't think, has finished a complete season his entire pro career uh, where you saw JT in college. I mean, he carried the ball a ton, I think like 900 times in his career and yeah. has not a lot missed of the games. <laughs> very, very durable. Um, so I think uh, I think Mack will spell JT. You know, he'll come in for a few snaps to keep him rested. But I think it's going to be the JT show with with Hines there if they need some pass catching ability out of the backfield. Yeah, I, I feel like I've read somewhere that like Mac actually caught passes in college and did a pretty good job on it. But um, I didn't look up those that those stats before I got on air. I wish I had. Um, but yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. I think he's just going to take over right away. There's almost no reason for for him to to stay on the field. Yeah. I mean, 21, 16, 28 receptions. Yeah. No, that's not, that's not really anything to write home about. Um, for Mac, that is, uh, yeah. I mean, the offensive line is phenomenal though. So, I mean, you know, he, he's going to be good for sure. Uh, at least this year and, and, you know, probably for the next couple of years, but, uh, I am slightly worried about, it. you mentioned all that, all those touches and all those rushes for, for Taylor in college. I am worried about the mileage he had. I mean, I know, I know you're saying he's durable, but I'm just, I just worry about like the tread on those tires is running pretty low already. Yeah, I agree. And I think in dynasty, I look at three years. If I can get three years out of my running back, I'm happy with that. Cause I'm going to be probably drafted another one any, anyway. So I think, I think we can get three, three good, really good years out of JT, maybe even four years. Yep. So I think that if you get that, you know, no matter where you draft him, you're, you're going to be happy with that. Yeah. I can agree with that. So the next guy here we've got is somebody who, who kind of surprised me jumping up above the running back that we're going to talk about afterwards. But uh, Cam Akers, Florida State running back, got drafted by the Rams. Obviously a phenomenal landing spot for any running back. We know that this offense can just – open up lanes for, for any running back. Maybe not as much as Gurley saw. You know, the offensive line isn't going to be what it was. The offense in general isn't going to be what it was a couple years ago. Um, but Cam Akers was, is one of these guys, in my opinion, that he had talent, but zero offensive line at of Florida State. Um, and <clears throat> he he tried to like jitterbug his way out of things too much and just didn't quite make things happen sometimes, but he's still produced at a fairly high level. Um, so, I mean, with just Daryl Henderson and Malcolm Brown there, I mean, what are we thinking about Cam Akers this season and beyond? I actually love Cam Akers. I jumped him up from, uh, I think I had him seven or eight, somewhere down the bottom of the first round. He's now my, uh, my RB three. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I love the landing spot. You know, I think all the Darrell Henderson owners were like, yay, Gurley's gone. And then they're like, oh, <laughs> crap, they got acres. Yep. <laughs> now, it lasted about three weeks before they got their mm-hmm. their their heart crushed. I think Cam Makers goes in there. He's a complete back. He can catch the ball out of the backfield. We saw that in college. Mm-hmm. You know, he's he's everything that Gurley was when Gurley was at the top of his game as far as his, his uh, measurables and such. Uh, so, yeah, I love Cam Makers there. Uh, I think he's going to be, you know, awesome in that offense. It's still a pretty young offense. You still have a great offensive coach there. Um, they struggled last year. They, they, they struggled, but they were still, you know, one of the top in the, in the NFL. They, they just missed the playoffs. So I think Akers plugs right into that offense and, and has an amazing season and a good career. Yeah, I, I like the landing spot a lot. I, I think the whole reason they went out and did this was because they saw what they got with Daryl Henderson and Malcolm Brown, which <laughs> wasn't anything so you know they they needed to go out and get something else to uh to fill in for Gurley after after they let him go so i like the pick yeah like i'm i'm gonna before before you jump on the next guy like i might be alone here i would not be one bit surprised if cam Akers is the top running back for 2020 out of this class just for this year at least yep i would agree with that um, just because everybody else went to pretty messy situations. Yeah. And this is acres backfield. Like I, I would not, I would be shocked if it was like a 50 or even a 60, 40 split between him and Henderson. Like I just Shouldn't don't see be. it, <laughs> but everywhere else it could <laughs> yeah. be, you know, like that's the thing. Yeah. So well, my, my, my co-host on uh, the, the armchair fantasy show, Ryan, he's a big supporter of state fan. So he loved acres. He's been talking about acres pretty much, you know, the whole off season. And of course he loves this landing spot. And he keeps telling me that acres played behind, you know, one of the worst offensive lines, not just, you know, this year or last year, but oh, in, he in the history of college football and how bad it was <laughs> goes to the Rams now who have, you know, a, a suspect offensive line, but it's like 10 times better than what he had in Florida. Of State. Course. So, so it's, it's like, yeah. you know, he already, already kind of used to it. Well, it's just the offense in LA or yeah. in LA too is, is just incredible. Like, it's going to spread the field for him so much more. The talent levels there, the coaching staff is better, better. Like I, I, I love this staff. Like in my opinion, I actually think I'm slotting acres as like, I, I don't know. Like I actually might be crazy and take him above like Hilaire. If it's just a redraft league this year, like, I don't know. I won't yeah. have to, cause I redraft, won't have to reach yeah, for it. I wouldn't mind it. I mean, that's, it's uh, like you said, it's, he's in the best situation. You know, Hilaire does have Damian Williams there and, Mm-hmm. And how will they use him? So it's always that question mark there. So yeah, Acres is he's going to have this backfield, and for a redraft league, he might have the best season for twenty twenty. Mm-hmm. So, all right. So the next guy we got here is uh, J.K. Dobbins, taken with the Ravens um, at the two twenty three fifty fifth overall. Obviously, the the Ravens are probably the uh, most run happy team in the league, uh, but they already have Ingram. They've got Edwards. They've got Justice Hill. I, I mean, where is Dobbins going to fit in here? For twenty twenty, if we're talking redraft league, he's probably not going to be the guy right away. You know, it might be sort of a Carlos Hyde, Nick Chubb type situation where Hyde starts off, you know, the season, and then Nick Chubb comes in to spell him a little bit, then blows up, and they trade Hyde away. Uh, I don't think they'll trade Ingram per se, but if you look at Ingram's contract, can't trade the hype man. Uh, what was that? What was so, that? Said so he can't trade the hype man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you look at Ingram's contract, they could technically walk, let him walk after this season because he's got. I think he's going to count six mil against the cap next year, uh, with only one mil of dead cap. So if if Dobbins is the real deal and they want to save some cap space, uh, they cut Ingram and then Dobbins becomes the man in twenty twenty one. And for Dynasty, I think he has the best long-term outlook uh, on that team because they're not going to change their offense. It's Lamar Jackson's show. It's going to be a run-heavy team, you know, for his entire career, which always helps the running back. I know we always think, oh, the quarterback takes the the carries. Sometimes he gets the touchdowns. But we've seen it in the past where a running quarterback helps the running back because they got those RPOs that, you know, kind of confuse the defense, open those lanes up for those guys. And, And Dobbins is no slouch in the passing game either. I think he can still catch passes. So I think, you know, Dobbins is is for long term I think he might be the better of these group. Yeah, I, I, 
I I liked I like the landing spot for him, but just not this year. I think long term it's phenomenal. So in dynasty leagues, he's probably like you know three or four in my, in, in my book for. But you're gonna have to wait to get production out of him. Um, so if you're if you're like a if you're a team looking to win right now, and you for some reason have an early pick due to a trade, I don't think Dobbins would be my guy. I think I'd go after somebody else. You know, if you got that window of, of trying to win win this year. Um, so. Uh, the last running back I want to talk about here is not the next running back taken. Uh, we kind of talked about that, that one earlier and that was green Bay taking AJ Dillon, who I like, but uh, this is not fantasy relevant in my opinion. <laughs> if I'm yeah. wrong, tell me, but I don't think I am. Uh, but it's, but it's Keyshawn Vaughn. The bucks took him in the third round. Um, you know, they got, they got Ronald Jones. They got rid of Peyton Barber. So it's, it's, uh, it's Ronald Jones and Aguna Bayale. Um, I, I mean, Vaughn to me is kind of is kind of just a guy. He's kind of like a Ronald Jones, maybe not even as good when you when you're looking at a tape in college. Uh, but you know, Jones hasn't been anything phenomenal in in the pros. He he's shown flashes here and there, uh, but obviously the pass protection is a big problem. And I think Vaughn kind of scores a little bit higher in, in those in that area. So. Where does Vaughn fit in on this offense? Who, in a lot of people's opinion, was pretty running back needy. I actually love this landing spot for him, especially with Tom Brady being there. I, I think you know you made the comparison to Ronald Jones and, and how they compared to each other. I think Vaughn is the much better pass catcher. I know it's not not hard to be a better pass catcher than Ronald Jones because he's terrible. Uh, so, but I think <laughs> Keyshawn Vaughn does uh, kind of open that up a little bit. You know, he can catch the ball out of the backfield. Uh, I think he's a he's a he's a, a all world athlete. You know the comp on I'm I'm on right now I'm, I'm player profile and you know they use the comp based on an algorithm based right. on metrics and their comp to him is Dalvin Cook. Wow. So I mean not to say that he's going to be Dalvin Cook, but if he's anywhere you know if he's half of what Dalvin Cook is, I think he's going to be you know a very good running back. I think you're going to get him probably late first, early second in most of your dynasty drafts. And he's going to be a, a very good value, especially with Tom Brady to be in there for at least one year, if not two. Uh, I think his value, I think the offense will be good. He'll get plenty of chances to score touchdowns. And I think he can have a very good season, at least for the next two when they got Tom Brady. After that, you know, who knows what they're going to have there. Damn, that's a crazy cop. I have not heard that one. Uh, I'm looking at the Pro Football Focus guide right now, and they have Bernard Pierce, which isn't anything fantastic. Yeah, but... I, I, like I said, the, the player profile one is based strictly on the metrics that they have. Yeah. There's no human interaction whatsoever, so it just spits out. They spit out, and Dalvin Cook was their comp, I guess. Yeah, I that'd be funny because uh, I actually was just helping a friend out with his super flex rookie draft, and he traded back from his first round pick, and kind of told him not to, but he ended up landing Vaughn in the second round. He got two early second round picks out of it. If he can get a Dalvin Cook type player in the and beginning of the first second round and yeah uh, after passing up justin Solid. jefferson then uh <laughs> he'll, i'm sure he won't be too sad yeah i doubt it yeah i doubt it too so all right let's wrap up the running backs here man give us your quick um so what there's six running backs that we talked about here give us your quick 2020 ranking of these six running backs and then your dynasty rankings of these guys real quick all right so I got my top 12 pulled up here, so I'm going to have to try to skip around here to make sure I get the guys that we That's talked fine. about tonight. I got CEH, you know, Clyde Edwards there. He's going, he's at the 101 for me. Uh, Jonathan Taylor is the is the number two there. Cam Akers at three. Uh, Swift is at four. J.K. Dobbins, five. And I think those top five right there are basically in tier one by themselves. And you can put, put them in a hat and pull whatever one out you want. I don't think there's really any order. You can put them in any order you want. Uh, after that, it's a little bit of a drop off, and I do have uh, Keyshawn Vaughn next. Okay. Uh, I think that covered all six of them, right? Yeah, that's basically yep. in order one through six on it my um, I think to the end of Gibson's and the Zach Mosses and all that. But yeah, those, yeah. Are, those are my six uh, uh, running back right there. Is that for Dynasty? That's for Dynasty? That's for Dynasty, yeah. If you're talking redraft, uh, let me see. I, redraft, I'm probably a, of the mind of you, I, I think I might move Cam Akers up to at least 102 um, over Jonathan Taylor. Uh, Edwards Lair is just, the offense is just so good. I mean, I just I can't ignore that fact that they're just so good. So he might still be the 101. Yeah, uh, I'll move it's Cam tough. Akers up. And then I think it's I think it's Taylor, Swift, Dobbins after that. Those three are right in a row. And then Vaughn will still pick up the, the last spot there. Yeah, I tend to agree with you there. So, all right, sounds good, man. Um, 
AJ, let's let's lead off with uh, the receivers here and close things out. All right. So first receiver taken off the board was a bit of a surprise. Mr. Henry Ruggs going to the Raiders at 112. I mean, his only real competition is Tyrell Williams. You know, so what do you think of Ruggs? I didn't like the pick until I saw the Raiders complete draft. And then it made a little bit more sense because I don't think Ruggs is going to be your prototypical number one receiver. I don't think he's a volume guy. I do think he could do things that, you know, people are like, oh, he's a speed guy. He's going to run deep every play. I think he's a little bit more than that. But I don't think he's going to be the guy that's going to get, you know, 10, 11 targets a game. Uh, but they went and got uh, uh, Ryan, I think, the or fourth rounds. So I think he can kind of be that more volume guy. They still have Hunter Renfro there as well. Uh, so Ruggs, to me, for, for purposes of fantasy, actually takes kind of a hit here. Uh, because he is sort of that big play threat, whereas I don't think uh, Derek Carr or Marcus Mariota are those big play type quarterbacks. So I think his value takes a little bit of a hit there. Uh, and then I think he's also going to be very inconsistent. I think he'll have games where he'll have like three catches, 112 yards, and two touchdowns. Then he'll come out and get three catches for 12 yards and no touchdowns. I think he'll be very inconsistent. Um, so for that reason, I dropped him down a little bit in my rankings. I'd like to see him go somewhere where he had a little bit more of a – a, a QB with a bigger arm that can get the ball down the field and kind of use his legs a little bit. But I do think Ruggs is the more complete receiver that he's getting credit for. So I do think in the long term for dynasty purposes, I think he's going to be a good receiver going forward. Yeah. PFF has him compared with Santana Moss and that'd be pretty phenomenal for like a career standpoint. But even Santana Moss at some point, you know, a lot of, a lot of times was pretty inconsistent. So I, I agree with you on that. I and mean, you see that from a lot of these like speed guys, you know, they, they have these like gigantic games and then other times they just disappear. So yeah. they're tough. They're tough for fantasy big time. Um, So yeah, moving on the, the guy who was taken as the second receiver, Jerry Judy, but was arguably the number one on most people's boards. Um, he now sits there with uh, Cortland Sutton, Noah Fant, and then uh, you know later on we're not going to talk about it, but but they but they talked about um, or but they ended up they ended up drafting uh, KJ Hamler uh, later from from Penn State. But you know they also have Melvin Gordon. They've got Phil Lindsay there still. So um, you know what what does Jerry Judy's outlook look like in in twenty twenty? And then you know you can keep going on with with dynasty value too i think his initial value may have taken a little bit of a hit because i don't think he's going to be the number one receiver where i thought if he went anywhere else he might have been the number one mm -hmm. receiver like if he went to the raiders i think he would have been number one easy uh but being there with sutton you know sutton i think believe going into his third year now he had a breakout season last year i think he's the the surefire number one so juju will play in the number two role uh, and then on top of that, you mentioned Melvin Gordon, Philip Lindsay. You know they're still going to run the ball there in, in, in Denver. They want to play good defense, run the ball. So I don't know how uh, how high volume passing they're going to be. So it's going to be tough for Judy to have the success that we had hoped that he would have uh, pre draft. With that said, I do think he is still uh, either one or two um, as far as dynasty receivers go. I do think the talent will sort of sh shine there. Uh, it all comes down to Drew Locke, and he's sort of the unknown, is what Drew Locke is going to be. Is he going to be the quarterback that they hoped they, he was when they drafted him? Um, or will he kind of be the quarterback that the Broncos have had ever since John Elway, where they've kind of all kind of faltered a little bit? So <laughs> I think not. it's all on Drew Locke's shoulder. Really pressure for him. I mentioned those weapons that they had. They also got Albert O, which is a tight end who's like super athletic, uh, the play next to Noah Fant. So he's got tons and tons of weapons. And it's it's really up to Drew Locke and how well he plays as to how Judy's uh, fan value is going to be. Yeah, I, I, I like the pick. Uh, aside from Sutton, they they really didn't have much there, and even Fant was kind of mediocre last year. I, I think part of that falls in with inconsistent quarterback play throughout the whole year and rookie so, tight ends <laughs> yeah i mean i do think uh i think he'll take a step forward this year and just getting judy on the field you know helps him as well um but i i 100 agree that it's going to take uh, a big step from from lock to to take over here <clears throat> excuse me so the next pick we have here 
is Mr. C.D. Lamb. Uh, Jerry Jones decided that he would outthink himself and everybody else in the league by taking him at 17th overall when he's already got Amari Cooper, who he just signed to a huge contract, and Michael Gallup. What do you think about this pick, and what do you think about CD's actual 2020 production? So when I originally got the pick, I was uh, extremely upset with it because I did have CD Lamb as my number one receiver, and I initially hated the landing spot uh, for two reasons. One, because I'm a Niners fan, and we uh, passed at, passed on him at 14. We traded back from 13 to 14. I'm like, oh, good. We'll still get CD Lamb, and we'll get an <laughs> extra pick. And then we didn't even take him. And I'm like, ah, you're killing me. Uh, so I hate, and then I hate it because yeah, I mean they got you know they got Gallup there, they've got uh, uh, a marquee like you mentioned, and they have some established guys there already. But the more I looked at it, I'm starting to like him more and more and move him back up to number one over Judy. Uh, and I'll tell you why. For one reason, uh, the vacated targets. I think uh, Randall Cobb last year had 83 targets. He's now gone. Uh, Jason mm-hmm. Witten, I believe, had 60 plus targets last year. He's now gone. Uh, so I think there's some targets to be had there as the number three receiver. And if you look at Amari, Amari Cooper's contract in two years, they most likely will either restructure his contract or they'll have to cut him outright. Uh, okay. cause he'll be owed like $40 million over the last two years of his contract. And that's a lot to pay to a wide receiver. I mean, that's like yeah. quarterback money right there. So, uh, the dead cap after 2021 is only 6 million. So they'll save, you know, $34 million by cutting Amari Cooper. So then, you know, C.D. Lamb steps right into that role. He's the number one receiver in that offense. I think long-term dynasty value, I think C.D. Lamb is definitely the one you want. I know initially you may have to just kind of be patient with him. He won't be as consistent because he won't be the number one there. But I do think there's still enough targets there for him to go around that I think he can still be relevant in both redraft and for dynasty in, in 2020, 2020. Yeah, he's definitely talented. I mean, I, I, you do worry about the receivers coming out of the Oklahoma system, right? I mean, just – the super spread systems in college, like you always worry about, you know, like the Oregon and stuff like that. But this guy, this guy just proved that he was just, you know, just uber talented and, you know, he just beat everybody. So it didn't really matter. Um, and, and he, you know, it didn't matter if it was just like a, a streak down the field, but he, you know, he, he could contest catches as well too. And he'd catch little hitches and didn't turn them into, 50 yard gains for touchdowns. It was it, pretty incredible watching this guy play. Um, yeah. I mean, for this year I, I I'm suppressing the value, but it is interesting that you brought up the whole fact that Cobb had 83, uh, 83 targets. I was not aware of that. So that's interesting. Um, uh, and, and I'm not really taking a whole lot of stock into the fact that Witten's gone. I mean, they're going to have Blake Jarwin, not that he's Witten, but, you know, Jarwin's going to be fine, and he could easily take the, the wit and rollover because it wasn't very much last year anyway. But, yeah, um, as we all know on this show, I'm not a Cooper fan, so <laughs> hey, they let him go in a couple of years, whatever. <laughs> so, all right, man, let's move on here. Uh, next, another another Philly pick here. We got Jalen Ragor. Um you know, he, he's joining the wide receiver core that we already mentioned was, was pretty beat up last year. And, and honestly, even when they were on the field, just didn't really produce. Um, so he, he is a huge need for this team, but is this the receiver that can do it for them? I think so. I know everybody kind of wanted them to take Justin Jefferson. And I do think if they did, I think Justin Jefferson probably would have been a better fit. Uh, but I don't think Rager is going to be, you know, it's not uh, it's not night and day. I think Rager is still going to be a great receiver there. I think everybody's kind of down on Rager because of his combine. He came out and said he'd be the fastest guy at the combine, and then he wasn't the fastest guy at the combine, not even close. So everybody was kind of down on him a little bit. But if you look at his – if you just forget about the fact that he said he'd be the fastest guy, just look at his numbers, his metrics. They're off the charts. Uh, everything else but his 40 time was off the charts. So I think this kid is definitely super athletic. Uh, I think he definitely comes in and competes for a, a spot in the starting role immediately. I don't think there's anybody besides maybe Alshon Jeffrey if he's healthy. But uh, I think even Rager can take over him eventually as well. And you look at that offense, you got Carson Wentz, you got Zach Ertz, you got Dallas Goddard. So I think he's going to have you know his pick pretty much uh, on the field. Cornerbacks are not going to be able to just double-team him like they normally would. So 
Rager, I love that pick. And he actually moved up one spot over Justin Jefferson in my rankings. I had uh, Rager at four uh, and Jefferson at three with his landing spot. I moved Rager up one spot. He's now my my three for receiver right behind Judy and Lamb. Yeah, I, I am one of those people that really wanted Justin Jefferson and uh, thought that they were going to take him because they were actually showing Jefferson on the phone <laughs> during the draft uh, when I jumped on to the the live broadcast of it. And it's like, oh, all right, sweet. They're, they're doing it. They're going with it, you know. But I, I'm still good with this pick. Um, you know, I, I decided to look a little more into it and not just go with the initial gut, you know, gut punch, if you will. But I, I think Rieger's going to be very solid for this offense. They need the speed. You know, he could turn into the next d and you've already got d there, you know, obviously on the downside of his career. But if he can stay healthy and stay on the field, I think he can still be an asset to this offense too. Um, Alshon's still the big body there. He's going to get his. Uh, so I, I think that this is, this is good. Plus, they traded for Marquise Goodwin. Also drafted John Hightower, so they they did hit their needs with wide receiver, um, as that was probably, I mean, it's a toss up between that and and secondary for their biggest weaknesses last year um, as a playoff team, um, you know, by default we'll call it. But uh, I like the pick. Yeah, I mean, I I like Rhaegar most than. A lot of people, I feel like, you know, coming into the draft, I feel like, you know, his quarterback play at TCU was abysmal. Um, and so that 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 really, you know, suppressed his his overall numbers. Um, so you can't just look at his stats and go, oh, he's not as good. This dude's a pretty freakish athlete, and he's such a good player. Um, it, it, to me, him and Jefferson are, are kind of right there. So, um, <clears throat> so. Speaking of Jefferson, AJ, go ahead and leave with the next guy. Yeah, so speaking of Jefferson, like you said, uh, Vikings took him with the very next pick. Yes, um, no digs. It, you know, it, it's to me, I feel like this is an immediate major role for him. Um, what are your thoughts on Jefferson? Agreed. I think he steps in. I think they you know, they traded for uh, or they signed a free agent, Tajay Sharp, and everybody went out and added him on free agents. And, and <laughs> leagues now they're like oh because he ain't no good (laughs) we can drop him now so yeah i think he steps into that role and you also have an aging injured adam Thielen, uh who's going to be kind of a shell of himself down the end of his career i think that jess jefferson will be the number one there the only thing that scares me obviously is we kind of mentioned it with the with the ravens a little bit too is they're gonna be a very run heavy offense with with dalvin cook there i think uh kirk cousins had a career low as far as attempts and pass attempts last year so that hurts him a little bit, but I do still think that he's going to be good enough that they're going to, you know, make him relevant in fantasy for sure. Yeah, I'm a big Jefferson fan. I think this guy's a big physical receiver. Um, he's just he, he's he's got uh, he, he he I think is one of the one of the big reasons why <clears throat> why Burrow looked as good as he did. This guy's just incredible. Um, so, uh, no, no complaints with the pick there. And, and I think the, the fit is better, especially for year one with him, uh, than, than some of the other receivers, even, even like Judy. Right. Um, yep. But uh, Judy's yeah. going to go earlier in, in redrafts just because he's Jerry Judy. And I don't agree with it. I won't, I won't, I probably won't reach for him. So, um, <clears throat> the last receiver that we've got, got listed here on the docket here is Brennan, Ayuk, I think I uh, pronounced yeah. that right. That's Ayuk. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll go with it. All right. Um, <laughs> 49ers took him at the very end, close to the very end of the first round. Um, I mean, like the 49ers have a ton of receivers. Uh, granted, they just they just traded one to the Eagles. Um, but except for Debo, like nobody really jumps off the page, right? So, how what what is his you know, outlook for this season, you know, knowing that it's basically Debo and in my opinion, it's just Debo and him. Yeah. I think, you know, being a Niners fan, I, you know, kind of was down on Ayuk just because I don't think we needed to trade up to get him for one. 
Uh, and then two, I think we could have gotten a receiver if we just stayed where we were. If it wasn't Ayuk, we could have got one of those other guys that were still on the board. So the fact that we did that kind of put a sour taste in my mouth. But then when I looked into it a little bit more, I think Ayuk is a good receiver. Not worth trading up for, I don't think, but I do think he can fit this offense very well. Uh, he's been kind of comped to uh, uh, a poor man's Golden Tate. He's a run after catch kind of receiver where they get the ball, the short screen, short quick hitches, whatever, and let him get you know in the open field and just do his thing. And that kind of fits the Shanahan offense, and I think that that's what they want him to be. I don't think Debo is a number one. I think Debo is a good number two. So I think Ayuk, uh, you know, and maybe not year one, but year two or year three, becomes that number one receiver. And we've seen it in the in the offenses before with Shanahan is they usually have one relevant receiver. You know, whether it be Julio Jones or going back to even Andre Johnson when he was with Houston, the offensive coordinator. Uh, and then the number two is sort of an afterthought. And I think if Ayuk can become that guy, I think he's going to be an excellent long-term addition. Uh, short term, that was a crowded sort of field there. You got Kendrick Bourne, who had a, a mm -hmm. decent season. He had, I think, five, six touchdowns. You got Jalen Hurd, who's returning uh, after his rookie season, being injured for the whole season. Uh, Pettis is still there, but I'm heard that he's on the roster level. He probably won't stay on the team for very long. So Ayuk is basically his job to lose. And, you know, they don't pass a lot, and that's the big knock on them is they have Jimmy G, who kind of just manages the game a little bit. Uh, but that's not what Shanahan wants to do. I think he wants to throw the ball. Uh, we saw that a little bit in the Super Bowl. We forgot to run the ball in the second half, and we lost that game. So uh, I think if Ayuk can be that guy where they just throw the ball constantly, I think he could end up being a huge, huge addition for us. Yeah, I think this guy, you know, he's a very shifty, like, in the middle, you know, catches the ball, make, makes makes plays once he catches the ball, right? Uh, and he's quick off the – quick off the line and stuff like that, but you know, like long-term speed. So he's not like a deep threat type of guy, but he, he can fit in that offense. Like he'll find space. If you can get him space, which you can in that offense, he, he could be phenomenal. Um, so I, I, I do overall like the pick. I think it's a, a good fit. And obviously if Shanahan's trading up for him, <clears throat> I'm paying attention to that. Yep. So, yeah, I think he obviously <laughs> likes him if he, if he was going that route to get him. Um, Absolutely. And I, I agree that I don't think he necessarily needed to, but, when you got to get your guy, you got to get your guy. So, yeah, I, I don't, I don't hate the pick. Yeah, I just pulled him up on Player Profiler, and I made the comp to Golden Tate, but they got one here that I like even better, and that's Victor Cruz. I think he is a very Victor Cruz s nice. receiver. So that's an awesome comp, I think. PFF has Pierre Garcon, which is also hey. very interesting. Yep, also a former yeah. hand receiver as yeah. well. So it's yeah. it's a good fit, dude. Um, all right, so. We had these guys listen initially, and then I realized I forgot a couple of first-round receivers. So we're a little over an hour. Let's just close it off with there was three – the first three round two picks, right? T. Higgins went to Cincy with the very first pick. Ne very next pick, Michael Pittman Jr. went to the Colts. And then very interesting player, LaVisca Chenault went to the Jags. Who's your favorite out of those three and why? Uh, my favorite out of those three is probably going to be T. Higgins. Okay. I think I've got them ranked right back to back to back in my rankings, but I think T. Higgins is a little bit higher up only because opportunity will be there sooner for him. You know, he's going to play with A.J. Green that first year. I doubt A.J. Green is back next year. Uh, who knows if A.J. Green even plays a full season this year. <laughs> um, so and step right into that number one role right away. Boyd's going to always be at number two. He's out at number one. I think he'll be at number two there. T. Higgins will be the number one. Obviously, I mentioned Burrow and that young offense that they have there. So I love him. Uh, with that said, though, uh, Pittman Jr. jumped up quite a bit in my rankings. He was in the top 12 when I did my original rankings. But after the draft, he jumps up because you got, you know, Rivers there. You've got T.Y. Hilton, who's kind of on the downswing of his career. And then after that, there's nobody there, really. You got Paris Campbell, who drafted last year, didn't do a whole lot. So Pittman can step into that number one role there with, in Indy and be great. Uh, yeah. LaVisca Chenault, the biggest knock on him is injuries. Uh, if you look at his college injuries, they're not as bad, but there was actually a major injury from high school that could be lingering as well. I actually had a, um, uh, Ethan Turner come on our show. He's a physical therapist, and he kind of does a, a injury breakdowns, and he was worried about LaVisca Chenault long-term. But if we take that out of the equation, I think LaVisca Chenault with that Jags offense can be can be awesome. He'll be a great complement to DJ Shark. I think Chenault will be the volume guy. Shark will be the big play guy. Uh, as long as he can stay healthy, I think he'll be great there. You want to hear something crazy about Chenault? PFF has his comparison, Saquon Barkley. <laughs> That's an interesting okay. one. 
It's All interesting. Right. Granted, completely swap of positions, right? But Chenault's <laughs> that type of player where he makes he can make plays from anywhere on the field, and they're going to use him. In my opinion, they're going to use him everywhere. They're going to do s- sweeps, screens. They're going to hand it off to him. Yep. Um, he's going to get used everywhere. He's going to be a little bit of a gadget player in year one, but I think this guy, the ceiling is crazy for him. Um, if the, if if he can stay healthy, and that is ex- absolutely the knock on him is the health. So, um, yeah, I I, uh, I I like, you know, you mentioned T Higgins. Uh, I like him being able to grow with Burrow. Pittman, I like the the opportunity that he's got there because again, like just nobody's behind Ty and Ty's hurt a lot. But Chenault, man, Chenault's ceiling I think is absurd compared to these other guys. But agreed. Um, I'm looking at player profile right now, and the comp they have to him is also very favorable. They got him compared to AJ Brown. So uh, yeah, to AJ no, Brown take on Barkley. You're you're getting good comps there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Chanel's I like both at, of those guys. So if I can his, get them in one guy, that's even better. His ability is off the charts. It's it's crazy. Uh, he's so strong. He's so fast. It's it. He's just good, um, but he's risky. So that's 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 the worry there. All right, Jeff, man. Um, I appreciate you coming on, man. This was this was a great conversation. Um, remind everybody where they can find you on Twitter and and everything else. All right, I'm on Twitter at Jeff Lambert 77. That's Jeff spelled G E O F F. A little bit different spelling there. Uh, of course, going for two.com, you can find us. We got 35 plus writers covering Dynasty. We cover nice. uh, the guy doing IDP now. We cover Daily Fantasy. We do a little bit of everything. And then every Tuesday uh, in the off season, we do a live show, the Armchair Fantasy Show. We're live on YouTube, Periscope, and <laughs> Facebook Live. Uh, and then, yeah, you can find me on Fancy Pros usually about once a week. I put an article out for them and I also do some ranking for them as well. So I'm everywhere. You can pretty much find me everywhere. Good stuff. Good stuff, man. Um, yeah. If you don't follow them already, follow them everywhere. They they do good stuff. Um, all right. Well, Jeff, thanks for coming on. Well, uh, we're going to close out and call it a night. All right, man. Awesome. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> all right. See Absolutely. You, Appreciate it. All right, AJ. I think that's it for the show. Uh, you got anything else to add before we cut it loose? No, nah, that's it. All I'm right. good. Yep. I talked enough, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Um, we will try to figure out more things to talk about. There's always NFL, I guess, but uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. So good night, everyone, and uh, talk to you later. Mm-hmm.